corn products, clearly ingested and converted from dietary sources. We forget too that glucose can be produced in the body intrinsically by the liver, and that's called gluconeogenesis or new glucose production. Glucose is kind of a big molecule. It doesn't just easily diffuse through the cells, um, you know, like some other molecules might, like you know, oxygen and CO2. It's actually quite, quite sizable, and so it needs help getting through the cell walls. So cell walls of target tissues actually have specific transport proteins and channels that help glucose get in there. And they're pretty much, pretty much located through all cells of the body. So I know it's a lot of detail. The important bit is that, you know, there's these, just knowing there's different types of transport proteins and that there are some that specifically need insulin to work. And that's why it matters. You know, the only reason we bring up the fact that glucose needs a transport protein is because insulin is the key to opening those locks to get sugar into the cells. And it, you know, so insulin works through these transport proteins and it's called um, facilitated diffusion because it needs, glucose needs help or facilitation to get through the cell. So yeah, don't, please don't try to remember like which glute does what, just know that they exist. So a lot of people hate carbs because carbs turn into glucose. I mean, the trick, the trick is that everything turns into glucose eventually, but carbs have a real higher uh, concentration of it Fructose and galactose, if you eat the alternative sugars, um, they get turned into glucose too. It just costs your body energy in the way of ATP to convert that to glucose. So we're gonna spend the next 10 minutes or so going through the Krebs cycle, kind of step by step. No, we're not at all, just kidding. <laughs> this is the entire slide. This is the only time we'll hear the words Krebs cycle in this, in this second bullet here. Um, I used to know a couple people who could just draw this from memory and I thought they were total nerds. And that's not me at all. <laughs> um, so we do, you know, glucose goes into the process and the whole purpose is to make ATP, right? Like that's the energy currency of the cell. That's the energy that our whole body runs on and all of our cells run on. So the anaerobic process has these three steps. Uh, generically, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, so that was the second time, sorry. And then the oxygen, uh, kind of the oxygen electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. This is separate from an anaerobic process that we get into when you don't have oxygen. But, so that's the whole summary. No diagrams. We're not going to talk about it any further. So gluconeogenesis we mentioned earlier. Um, I was thinking about this word earlier because we we hear about it and it's like one of those like long fancy words we don't use very often but it's something that i think we forget about we have these diabetic patients who are like oh i don't understand why my glucose is so high i haven't eaten in like two days and and this is why you know when you're not taking in sugar your body makes it it says you know screw you you're not eating i'm just going to make my own sugar and it has a limited capacity to do that it's very energy intensive for the body but it could do it um, and so when you have low blood glucose on a regular basis, you don't have stores of carbohydrates, then you make your own. So this involves um, the adrenals kicking out, primarily kicking out like epinephrine and cortisol. And so you get all the amino acids come together um, to make glucose. We'll talk a bit about insulin. We mentioned earlier that it's made in the pancreas um, by the beta cells and the islets of Langerhans. Sounds very exotic. So insulin, as I mentioned before, in, is really integral in the process of bringing glucose into the cells. And so in only about two thirds of the cells, a lot of the important bits, skeletal muscle and fat, that we use insulin primarily to transport glucose. Insulin is a hormone, as we mentioned, hormone in the first slide. So it's just a chemical that is distributed to act on some other target tissue. Uh, binds with the muscle cell receptors, increases the permeability of glucose. Interestingly, um, the half-life of any given amount of insulin is only about six minutes, and so, which is pretty short, and it makes sense if you're giving someone, you know, people are taking regular insulin, we hear about that, very short-acting stuff, um, and so the body needs a pretty 
constant uh, production of insulin to have effect. I was going to skip through this, um, this graph because it's kind of an old school graph, but I think it's really fascinating. So on the y-axis, the horizontal axis, you have um, glucose outside the cell, like in the bloodstream, going from zero all the way up to about 750 before it stops. On the y-axis, you have intracellular glucose. So they're measuring glucose inside a muscle cell. And you see that bottom line, the black line, is the control. And so that's what happens to the glucose inside the cell when there's no insulin. You see nothing happens. No matter how high the glucose is in the bloodstream, it's not getting into the cell. And the red line is if you're adding insulin. And you can see it's got a nice steady climb. So you clearly, that's why I say this is an old school slide. Like this is early demonstration of the importance of insulin moving glucose into cells. I think that's a little bit fascinating. Um, also why, you know, we see patients whose blood sugar could be, you know, this is part of the effects of diabetes, like their sugar in their blood is super high, but it's not getting into the cells to actually do anything to like create energy to have any kind of metabolism. It just sits out there in the cells and then they pee it out. So diabetes mellitus, we mentioned earlier, the sweet urine, please don't check. Um, carbohydrate utilization is reduced, while well, that of lipid and protein is enhanced. You might notice that in the paper in front of you. <laughs> um, so diabetes mellitus is caused by insulin deficiency in one form or another. So insulin does a number of things. We talked about increasing membrane permeability to glucose, um, increases um, glucose phosphorylation, or it sort of pushes it towards, towards uh, ATP production, um, it increases fat synthesis, it does all sorts of stuff. So if your blood glucose levels are low, and you alluded to this earlier, your body releases its own glucagon. And glucagon's primary, primary purpose is to help your body make new sugars through that liver process that we mentioned before. Um, epi and norepi are released, which is also not surprising. If your body goes into kind of a freak out state, it's stressed out when it doesn't have enough sugar. And so it, it uses epinephrine as a vehicle to make more sugar. Releases cortisol, growth hormone, and your body's also smart. So it's got low sugar and it says, I'm going to inhibit insulin production. Because it doesn't make sense to have a bunch of insulin when you have low blood sugar already. So two types of diabetes, and I think this is a very important thing to have in your, in your brain, like functionally talking to patients. And it's, it's easy to get mixed up. I think we just hear diabetes and think diabetes. So type one is when your body doesn't make insulin. Your pancreas, the beta cells just don't function as they should. And so that's the main issue. So you just don't have any insulin. And so these patients end up being completely insulin dependent, basically. And we'll talk more about this in a sec. Type 2 diabetes, they make plenty of insulin. It just, they become resistant to it. Their cells and those transport proteins just don't like insulin. It just doesn't have the effect it might in uh, your typical patient. So they just can't use it. So type 1, we mentioned, they're just not making it. You know, the rest of their cells work. Their cells are craving insulin. They just don't make it out of their pancreas. And this is less common, so this is 10% of all diabetic patients. And these are typically the sicker of the diabetic patients. Not super common, typically early onset, because you can't only live so long without making insulin in your body. So these are the, the kids that come in just super sick. They come in a DKA. That's usually the presenting issue, because you have no idea. You know, suddenly the two-year-old's like obtunded and looks like crap. And it's because, you know, their sugar is, you know, is uh, you know, way over the top from their lack of insulin. Scary thing, a um, bit of a trivia that it's more common in, in white people than black people or Hispanics. But part of this is that it's a genetic, a genetic thing. Diabetes type two is usually, there's a little bit of genetics. Most of it's just poor life choices and kind of you know, poor body function, but this is more likely to be um, genetic, so. These patients are completely insulin dependent. Most of them are either giving themselves insulin all day or they have a pump. And these are the ones that get in the big trouble like on airplanes. You know, they took their insulin planning to have lunch on the plane. There's a bunch of turbulence like, oh, we can't come down and bring the carts for an hour. 
and then they become unconscious because you know, they were they're trying to time their insulin with their food and it doesn't work. I used to go, one of my cousins is a type one diabetic and I remember going out to I think Chevy's or Chili's or somewhere and she like gave herself her insulin before we left the car and then we were waiting forever for a seat. I don't know what the story was and she started getting like really pissed. <laughs> like I only got so much time before I need to eat. You know, I'm starting to feel like crap already just waiting in the waiting room um, to get seated and it's, it's a big deal and there's no taking it back. Once you give the insulin, it's in there, and you got to eat or do something. Um, all diabetics are at increased risk of infections, kidney disease, eye disease, anything that has little tiny blood vessels, which is pretty much every organ, every tip of every extremity. So I mentioned some of this. So we have destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas over time. This is part of why we don't have the neonates crashing because it takes a little bit of time for this destruction to happen in the body otherwise like you know all the diabetics would come out of the womb um, you know needing insulin peak onset is is a uh, you know later in life later in childhood 11 and 13 and it could be quite young it's exceedingly rare to see it later you know over 30. so the symptom onset is abrupt because we don't know what's there you know, diabetes type two happens over years and years and years. This, they kind of just fall off the cliff eventually with insulin and, and with their sugar. And like I mentioned, they're you know, prone to DKA in that because they have no idea it's happening. So they just feel really crappy, thinking they got a cold for a week and then suddenly they're in DKA. So we get all the polys in diabetes. What's well, polydipsia? Yeah, right. Excessive thirst, polyuria, right? We pee too much. Polyphagia. Yeah, eating too much. Then, yeah, weight loss and fatigue, I think, is to be expected. So, I don't know about you guys. I feel this picture is a little bit offensive to people that like to watch TV, drink beer, and smoke, and wear a ball and chain, but that's just me. Free to be me, it says. So type 2 diabetes is insulin resistant. So the body's making plenty of insulin. The beta cells are doing their thing. But then when it gets to the target cells, they just don't play well with insulin. So the transport proteins aren't working. The kind of lock and key mechanism of insulin isn't working. So this is the majority of diabetics. If you ever had to pick the patient's like, I'm a diabetic, probably a type 2. Usually they, I don't want to stereotype, but this is kind of what you're looking at. Like in your average diabetic is this is this picture and that's why it's here. The type ones are usually quite skinny um, because they're constantly fighting this kind of um, this kind of insulin and glucose issue but the type 2 diabetics you know, have sugar that's up all the time and they're usually diabetic because of um, you know lack of activity and certain foods and genetic factors. It's scary to think that it's over 10% of the entire population in the United States but it's also not surprising any of us in this job can affect all ages. We usually think of it as being older people because you have to accumulate these sort of insults in your body over the years, but there's more and more like juvenile type two diabetics, you know, huge kids, you know, like 200 pound, 10 year olds. But if you had to choose on a test, I'm not saying it's on this test, but if you had to choose, you would usually think of older people being type two for onset and younger people being type one. That's kind of the standard. Um, as I mentioned, with type 1, they're at risk of any infection, certainly, but vascular problems of any organ and any, you know, distal extremity. So these are like the old ladies who complain of foot pain for a month, and we x-ray them and find a 6-inch sewing needle in their foot because they had no idea they stepped on it because, you know, they can't feel their toes and their feet, and you can't feel the tips of their hands. You know, the neuropathy is a, the early thing, and they're constantly tripping and kicking stuff, and they have no idea that it happened. I had that twice in the same day. It was a very bizarre ER shift, and they were not in the same house. <laughs> this can be controlled. It cannot be cured. You can't really cure diabetes, but you can control it um, and meet, like mediate your body's uh, reaction to it with diet, exercise, and weight loss, none of which patients like. You know, most of them want you know, a prescription to fix it, um, but that's not, you know, that's not real life. 
So these patients are the ones that take orals. So type 1 diabetics, they need insulin. They can't take metformin or whatever to fix them. They need insulin. But type 2s can take oral medications. If that's not cutting it, then they need to be put on insulin as well. Certainly a less intensive insulin regimen than the type 1 diabetics. So if we're gonna measure the insulin levels in type twos, they, they might be normal. And if we're gonna measure the beta cell function, that one might also be normal because they're just not using it. I mentioned this before, they're generally older patients, but not always, um, often obese with lots of end organ complications. So much so that if we put the diagnosis of diabetes down in our chart in the ER, like they won't accept it unless you list all the different complications that they have, you know, it's diabetic with nephropathy or diabetic with you know, whatever, with heart disease, because there's so many ways in, to have diabetes and so many ways that it affects people. So how we end up seeing these patients, um, and I'll leave the cynicism out of it for a moment, is, um, is that diabetics can get, are chronically dehydrated, and if they have any kind of little thing happen, like they get a cold or a little other kind of virus or UTI, that just like worsens their dehydration um, and their acidosis. And because sugar is, like I said, a big molecule in diabetics of type 2s, especially, they have a ton of sugar in their bloodstream. And your body's way of trying to deal with that is to try to dilute it. And so all the water in your body kind of comes out of the cells, comes out of the other places that you'd want it to be in the interstitium, and it floods into the bloodstream to try to equalize that sugar gradient. And that makes people just pee a lot more than they should. And so they're almost always dehydrated. And then you get acidosis, um, a lot of the same processes, trying to deal with this blood sugar, not having enough sugar in your cells. And so you're kind of constantly running on like a cellular, like anaerobic uh, metabolism. So your body's like, almost like exercising all the time when they're clearly not exercising, but the cells feel like they're exercising and they're burning a lot of fats because they're not able to utilize the sugars. And so they're always a little acidotic, always a little dehydrated. And so it doesn't take a lot to push them over the edge um, to be really sick. So diabetics more likely to get atherosclerosis. They get all the little vessel disease and capillary leak. We mentioned the neuropathy where their the nerves just aren't working so good. Um, autonomic dysfunction as in they're, you know, they stand up and they're not able to really regulate their blood pressure, so they get really orthostatic. Um, and then demyelination, oh, abnormalities is Schwann cells. What, uh, what system in the body are Schwann cells part of? What do you think? Is it cardiovascular, derm? Yeah, CNS, that's peripheral nervous system primarily. That's like a real throwback. <laughs> I can still picture it though. Um, so hypoglycemia, you know, clearly fall in blood glucose concentrations. For our purpose, it's when it really has symptoms. And so we always ask, there's always this hard number like, oh, well, their sugar was only X, so they're not hypoglycemic. It's like, no, their sugar was X and they feel like crap and they can't stand up or they're confused. It's really person to person. So we know the people who are hypoglycemic, particularly like very low, get diaphoretic and tremulous and tachycardic get really confused and weak. This is the dangerous part. We don't, you know, unless they're really acidotic, we don't care so much if someone's sugar is 500, but if their sugar is 50, that's a big problem, right? That, that leads you to your final common pathway, your seizure coma death. Um, but it's like, say you're on an airplane and someone is diabetic and they're confused and shaky and people always wonder, oh, if I can't check their glucose, I don't want to give them sugar. It's like, if it's sugar is 400 and you give them a orange juice, we don't care that it's 500. But if you let them sit there while you like, you know, wring your hands over it and their sugar is 40, that's a big, a much bigger problem and you're not gonna make it to Vegas, you know what I mean? Like, you're gonna have to catch the next flight. Um, you can get gradual symptoms and, and some of these patients that just run low all the time, fatigue, confusion, headache. These are harder because we, we don't know what this means in a lot of patients. So I'm going to skip into some of this. You know, the cause a million causes for low blood glucose. The primary ones in diabetics is that they're, the top one on the right is that they take too much insulin or they took it and didn't eat, like I mentioned, the type 1 diabetics. That's the number one cause. Um, 
factitious is something we think about a lot. We get you know, repeat visits in the ER, especially in like a kid with low blood glucose. And we're like, where is this coming from? And some people use their low blood sugar as a way to get attention and to get kind of healthcare attention. Um, sulfonylureas are on here, um, like metformin. Um, oh, the glipizides, that's the zides. So they can cause that. Metformin's the one that does not, by definition, drop blood glucose. It just keeps it from going high. And we'll talk about the meds in a bit. I think else on here that's important. So pre-hospital management, you need to think of it first. It's like any diagnosis in medicine. Like if you can't think of it, you're never going to diagnose it. So you always have to have in the back of your mind, like, is this hypoglycemia? My experience, my short experience so far in the region is that you guys are really good at checking blood glucoses when it's appropriate or even remotely on the radar. And I think that's awesome because we get really, it kind of sneaks up on us. You know, we go down another track and, you know, an hour later, like, oh crap, their sugar was low. But so far, everyone I've seen has been really good. Um, the technical definition is less than 80 in a known diabetic because they live at, you know, two, three, 400. Um, in a non-diabetic, less than 60. But as I mentioned before, any blood glucose that's low-ish that is causing symptoms, that counts as hypoglycemia. It's the same thing with blood pressure. You know, you get the, the old granny whose blood sugar is normally 180 and comes in, it's 120 in a trauma, that's pretty hypotensive for her, even though by any definition it's not hypotension. So this is, you know, putting the clinical picture together. Um, clearly if it's low and they're conscious, you can give them oral glucose, you know, the orange juice from the fridge or the glucose paste or whatever it may be. You don't want to start, you don't want to put a funnel in their mouth and start pouring in, glu you know, orange juice if they're unconscious. You know, it's not the princess bride where you can do that kind of stuff. If they're not able to take oral glucose, you could start a line. We know about, you know, given D10 now, um, used to be D50. And oftentimes, in, particularly in the like real bad diabetics, you can't get a line or they're dehydrated and really sick. And then you're looking at um, IM glucagon. This is one of those situations, I had a conversation with someone about this recently, that if we think they're diabetic and we think they're unconscious, obtunded, they can have a GCS of three from their sugar being low, and we normally go down the ABC route and kind of get to the line and the glucose later. But if you have a really high suspicion that this, you know, you check their sugar and it's 20 and they're unconscious, like if you can get that glucagon in them or the sugar in them, like they'll wake up. It's like magic, like a magic antidote that you may think about doing that, you know, instead of just starting at the airway. Because by the time you get down to like, you know, C and then down to G for glucose, I mean, they're gonna, you know, already have this stuff done when all they needed was some sugar. And then you're, what are you gonna do when they're GCS of 15 and intubated? That becomes much more complicated. Um, so think about it, if you have a really high suspicion that this is all hypoglycemia and they're really out of it, you know, just try to fix the sugar first, if you can do so in a timely fashion. Um, if you fix their sugar and they're still altered or out of it, you got to think that maybe you're on the wrong track. Um, you know, so we talk about the ultra mental status protocol, recheck the sugar, think about other stuff. EKG, secondary survey, is this the diabetic that just got hit in the head with a hammer and is unconscious because of that? That happens. Anybody who's on an anti-hypoglycemic agent, so any of the, the medications, the long-acting insulins or particularly any kind of... Um, the PO meds we should try to transport. I know that's difficult because most people wake up, it's like the you know heroin ODs, right? They wake up and they don't want your help anymore. It's like, thanks for saving my life, but I'm good. That's what you get with the hypoglycemic sometimes too. So I appreciate in saying that transporting them is difficult, but I think you should try to encourage people to do that because this isn't a normal thing. Like they've been taking these meds every day for years usually. Why is it today that their sugar was 20? You know, I think it's extremely hard to figure that out in the field. And there's no way for you to reassure them that it's not gonna happen again or that they're not gonna drop 20 minutes later. So the note here is giving IV glucose. Um, if the sugar is really low, even if you gave oral glucose, just to try to get them up where they need to be. So we'll talk a little about ketoacidosis. And this is what I mentioned in the beginning is one of those situations that is super life-threatening that we don't, I guess I don't 
normally think about when I think about the endocrine system, but you know, clearly all this diabetes stuff, it's important. And DKA is a way that you know people die, you know, really in a really ugly fashion, and we can make a big difference in. And so this can happen in all diabetics. Um, it's most problematic in the patients that are type one. So yeah, let's not go through this whole thing, but it's this is basically like a vicious cycle of. Um, hyperglycemia, which causes them to become acidotic and dehydrated from the stuff we mentioned earlier. Their, their sugar is super high. They're peeing a ton to try to like dilute that out. They get dehydrated. They get acidotic. And that just you know, goes into a, a vicious cycle. Part of it, if you look on the far left and can read it, metabolic acidosis causes one of the hallmark symptoms of DK, which is the coup small respiration. So one of your clues to DK is that one, they look like crap sugar is high, but they're also breathing like a freight train, trying to blow off all that, um, basically through CO2, trying to correct their metabolic acidosis. So these patients can present in shock, they're hypovolemic, um, and extremely altered. If you could smell, this is one of those smelly things, if you could smell ketones, you might smell ketones, but some people don't have the ability to smell that. So I jumped ahead, but it's good to go over this more than once. So polyuria, so they're peeing a lot, they're dehydrated, they have lots of like electrolyte abnormalities which you won't be able to detect. Some may have profound hypokalemia which would make you think this could have some cardiac effects too, arrhythmias and the like. Two small respirations are number one for a reason because that's one of the ways we know this isn't our typical just high blood sugar call is that they're breathing you know, super fast, super deep, trying to blow off the CO2. It's also a hint to you, this is not in the talk, but it's a hint to you that if you have to intubate these people, you're not gonna put them on a rate of 10. You wanna match, you're breathing 40 times a minute for a reason, and that's to keep them alive in the, in the fixed or acidosis. If you put them on a rate of 10, they're gonna die. So you wanna try to match their you know, tidal volume, but that's just an aside. Um, they can be orthostatic, hypoten you know, they're hypotensive, they can be fatigued to somnolent. Um, clearly not eating, a lot of nausea, vomiting in this population, belly pain. They love them, they're awake, want to drink, because that's their way of compensating for the high glucose. So as far as pre hospital goes, we're really, you know, we're looking at managing your ABCs like normal, if need be, and then, you know, these patients need a lot of fluids primarily for the acidosis. In the hospital, we're looking at fixing lots of stuff. We're starting insulin drips and all sorts of things that just you know, aren't feasible pre-hospitally. Alcoholic ketoacidosis, just to change gears a little bit for like one or two slides, is, is also very interesting because this is something we forget about with the volume of drunks that we see and the volume of alcohol withdrawal that we see, is that some of these alcoholics actually get quite ill. You know, because this is your typical patient who's been you know, they were off the wagon for a bit or they're in jail and kind of forced to be off the wagon for a bit and they come out like raging. You know, they have like two weeks straight, all they're doing is just drinking and sleeping, drinking and sleeping, not getting any real nutrition. They're just drinking beer and having a good time. Um, and then when they stop that, they end up being, um, get really acidotic because they've had no nutrition, no glucose input um, whatsoever for that period of time. So they end up being really dehydrated um, and really acidotic. And so we treat these pa patients a little bit different. So these patients are not your typical, you know, withdrawal. So nausea, vomiting, belly pain, shortness of breath. They just look crappier. Like they're the ones in the emergency department that we give them a couple liters of fluid, some Zofran, and we look and we're like, man, you still look like crap, you know, like what is going on? And you, you know, we check um, some labs and find them to be quite acidotic. So for us, at least, in addition to fluids, like they need you know, these are ones that get put on little like D5 or you know, some kind of sugar drip or as soon as they start eating, they can tolerate food, they start feeling better. Oh, I like this, <laughs> the very bottom. It explains the popularity of crappy restaurants on Sunday morning. So, so if, if the patients can get the nutrition back, their body will compensate. You know, they can rehydrate and get nutrition, they will compensate. I, I think that's funny. Hyperosmolar syndrome, this is the classic uh, like med student conundrum uh, on the medicine ward. It's like, is this, high, is this like diabetic sick person, is this DKA, which is the most common thing, or is it this 
this other one, the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome or coma. When I learned it, it ended with coma, which can tell you what happens to these patients. They're quite sick. So this is very similar to DKA. Um, you should see it in type 2 diabetics. The only issue is that they don't have, they don't make ketones, and that's kind of clinically one of the ways that we know um, that it's not DK. You won't really have a sense of that pre hospitally But these are the patients that look sick and their sugar is super high. Like DKA patients, they can have DK and the sugars of four or 500, sometimes 600. These patients have a sugar of like 800 or undetectably high on your monitor, which is terrifying, I think. Um, so this is just another thing to be aware of. Same kind of manifestations, they have the same altered mental status, they're still peeing a ton, they look terrible, um, and they all need um, IV fluids and you know, admission, usually like ICU admission. This has a higher mortality. I, I don't know, I guess I don't know why offhand my gut would be is because I guess in the hospital we think, we see the ketones and the acidosis, we know they're sick, and these patients don't necessarily have those same lab abnormalities. They'll be acidotic, but then we have no ketones, and we start going, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, it's just high blood glucose, and I don't know about you, Marty, but <laughs> I see, if I don't see ketones, I'm slightly less worried in some of these yeah, patients. Yeah, tends, tends to occur in older patients, too, so they have more, you know, comorbid yeah. conditions. Yeah, that's good. And it's less common. We think DK a lot. We see it every day, but this is something we just don't see very often. So common meds, um, we hinted to this earlier, the sulfonylureas. We just put that out there so you're aware of some of these categories, and you, you hear these things. I think we mention it through paramedic school, but patients are on all sorts of stuff. And it's not a comprehensive list, because every week there's like a new, a new med, like on the Lifetime channel that they're advertising. Ask your doctor about this thing I can't pronounce. Um, so glipizide, gliburide, glucagon are the common ones that are uh, sulfonylureas. What's good to know about this category is they can alone cause uh, significant hypoglycemia. You got these guys, uh, acarbose, miglitol, less common. They decrease carb absorption. They're not a good standalone. These are usually meds that are added on as sort of adjunctive meds, like, hey, your glipizide's not cutting it. Let's try this thing. Uh, the biguanides are really... You never hear it called that because basically you're looking at metformin. A lot of people are on metformin. That's one of the first things we put type 2 diabetics on. As I mentioned before, this is one that alone does not drop blood glucose. So someone's hypoglycemic and they're only supposedly taking metformin, you got to start looking at other stuff um, because it just prevents glucose from going high. I won't say it's a never, but it's just not designed that way. And so just keep, if you have that one patient, you're like, and blaming the metformin, you're probably missing the boat. And this other category, I don't pretend to ever pronounce. There's some other medications like Avandia and Actos that just help insulin do its thing, which can also cause hypoglycemia. Different types of insulin. Um, regular insulin we see, the rapid acting, has a real short onset. A lot of people are on regular or some combination. We have NPH, which is intermediate insulin. Um, usually a couple hours in length. And then there's the really long acting. Some people, uh, lenti is like long, so ultra long acting, ultra lenti, that some people can take you know, once a day and then they do regular with their, um, with their meals. But when someone says around insulin, just, it's good to ask them like what kind of insulin. And they, most patients are reasonably savvy in their insulin, they'll know if it's sort of a fast acting or if it's a long acting one. And then you know what you're up against. If it's a hypoglycemic patient, they're like, oh yeah, I took my ultra super long acting forever insulin today. And then you gotta be a little bit more worried than if they were just taking a regular. And you know that in an hour with their sandwich, they're gonna be good if they just took their regular. So we'll talk about a few complications. I think that um, hyperkalemia is one that we don't think about um, in endocrine. And it's got a lot of other effects, but um, in the context of diabetes, we'll talk about it. And I personally really like hyperkalemia. I was like a, a USAR doc for a long time, and CRUSH and HyperK are kind of our bag. You know, that's like our special thing we talk about in, uh, in urban search and rescue, so I think it's kind of fun. And it's a thing we can, one, diagnose, and two, fix. That's life-threatening, which is pretty rare, I think, in medicine for the most part, to find stuff we can figure out and fix pretty quickly. 
Um, so we have issues with hyper-K because in diabetes, you have renal disease, you can't actually excrete the potassium as normal, so that level goes up. Um, you have issues with cellular shifts related to insulin, and then um, the potassium, as the glucose goes up, potassium kind of falls along with glucose, um, which goes into why we use insulin to fix hyper-K. I think we're all pretty familiar with hyper-K. I think it's good to think about, you start out with traditionally these tall peaked T waves, and that's the classic one of the EKG that we can identify. The T waves are just super tall and pointy. I asked one of my mentors once, like, what, what counts as a peak T wave? Because we look at them all the time and go, ah, I don't know, and he said, one you wouldn't want to sit on. And I remember that. <laughs> and so um, I think that's a good description. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as the K gets higher, this degrades and you get the QRS widens out, you know, the P wave flattens out and you end up with this sort of sine wave. You know, I think of it as somebody grabbing, you know, each end of that, that EKG kind of rhythm strip and just pulling it out. And you start with peak T waves and you grab each side of it and you pull it out, your QRS widens, your P, your P wave comes down and the whole thing um, gets flatter. I'll show you some some descriptions. And this can clearly degenerate to V-fib and heart block and asystole. These numbers on here are um, kind of a good reference point and they show that it, as it gets higher it gets worse. Just depends on the patient. If, some, if it's a normal patient who's K of 6, they can arrest at a K of 6. If you have an end-stage renal guy in dialysis, they can walk in at a K of 9 and like not know the difference. I worked in Dallas a number of years ago at a hospital I can only describe as a end-stage renal disease center of excellence. Um, <laughs> we had a program, they call it compassionate dialysis, so there's a lot of um, unfunded and undocumented patients who had end-stage renal disease, kind of an insane number of people who mostly in childhood had a, you know, a bad illness or some other issue with uncontrolled diabetes and were on dialysis and like 20 years old, which is really sad. So we would literally have 60 to 80 of these patients every day, would check in the ER in the morning, and we'd get labs on them, we'd get EKGs on them. If they looked like they were just gonna die that day, they would get dialysis for free. And if not, they would go home and come back the next day. But what that meant is we got a ton of patients whose Ks were walking in seven and eight with pretty normal looking EKGs, because that was just, you know, getting dialysis twice a month, that's where they lived. I had to explain to all the residents and the students there, this is not normal. <laughs> when you go out into the real world and you see a K of six or seven, you should be really concerned. But here, we're seeing crazy sick people who just can tolerate that. They're, they're still alive because they can tolerate it. But there were patients who, there's one guy in particular who was in his 20s that I think every doc had coded at least once because he, he didn't want to be there. You know, some people would come every day and check in. He would come only when he felt awful. And man, the guy would just, when you saw him, he knew like he was gonna code probably that day or the next day, it was, it was very scary. Fortunately, we can fix that, right? Like we have things to fix K with. So other issues with um, potassium, because it's involved in so many cells and integral to muscle use, patients can come in with weakness or with kind of numbness and tingling. If you ever check reflexes, um, if you have like the orthopedist reflex hammer, which is like your stethoscope around your neck, um, you can check reflexes. People can get paralysis. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is possible, although vomiting and diarrhea usually drop your K. Here you can start to see, oops, I'm sorry, you can start to see some of the peak T waves, I think that are early. Um, some of them you probably wouldn't want to sit on. You know, like you're looking at V3 and and like V4, those are pretty tall and pointy. I'm not making any uh, lifestyle judgments. I mean, whatsoever. Um, as the K is going up, you can start to see that you maybe have like, say look at V3, you have, they're still a little bit pointy, but they're getting kind of wide. The QRS is getting wide. This is, you might at first glance think this is kind of nonspecific. Oh, I don't see a STEMI. When you look closer, you're like, dude, like everything is wide and just does not look good. And this starts to make you nervous. You know, here it's like really slowing down. You know, we've sort of lost the wideness, but we're now we're like into some, you know, crazy bradycardia. You see that potassium is eight, which is, you know, twice normal basically. 
And this too, I think, is a little nonspecific. You wouldn't look at this at first glance and think hyperkalemia, but what you see is that it's really not right and that it's kind of widening out and just looks, just doesn't look right. Um, that's usually what I think of with potassium high K. It's like the EKG just doesn't look right. My brain immediately goes to potassium. And you can see like in V4, I mean, the, that's pretty like, you, know, you got some tall stuff. Is that a T wave? You know, I think it's a tall T wave. Um, it's hard to tell. This stuff too, very wide and wacky. The potassium is super high. So we don't have a great sine wave, but you know, the sine wave is like the you know, old oscilloscope where it's just kind of like you know, going like this. And that's what it can degenerate to. The lesson I think in this is anytime you have someone who's, who's sick and you see just like a wide wacky EKG, you have to think hyperkalemia. I've seen a couple of arrests where the patients, you know, they're just widening out, widening out, and then they go into like into V-fib or like a pulseless VTAC and then you know, give them some calcium and they come right back. And it's something we can actually fix. And so you have to think about it because your normal, like your epi and everything else isn't gonna, isn't gonna fix this problem. So as far as treatment, I mentioned we can fix this. Um, we have cardiac membrane stabilization. We try to shift potassium um, you know, back into the cells where it doesn't cause any trouble. So if it's inside the cells, it doesn't cause any issues. The body doesn't really sense that. It doesn't affect your heart and other things. And then we want to get rid of the K. So calcium, I've only ever heard this described as it stabilizes the cardiac membrane. Um, I don't fully understand the mechanism. That's how I've heard it um, from everyone I've ever talked to, um, but it does seem to work. Do you have a real kind of a pissed off myocardium for lack of a better term? It's really irritable, just really angry about this potassium thing, um, and wants to go into V-fib, wants to go into arrhythmia, and so the calcium kind of chills that out a little bit. Albuterol actually pushes potassium into the cells temporarily, it works pretty fast, and pushes uh, potassium into the cells where it can't cause any trouble. Bicarb 2 theoretically shifts potassium, um, as does insulin. So as I mentioned before, potassium travels with the glucose, and so if you give insulin, glucose goes into the cells, and potassium kind of trails right with it. The issue is that if someone, you give somebody insulin, and you're gonna drop their sugar, and those 80 patients a day I mentioned who came to our uh, end-stage renal center of excellence, the only way we ever hurt those people is by giving them insulin and by dropping their sugar. And so we have to be really careful about that, even in a diabetic. And that's why we say give it with D10 or D50 because you have to modulate that. Even in a diabetic, you give them 10 units of regular and they're sick from whatever reason, it's just gonna bottom them out and you will hurt people that way. So that's the part that makes me nervous every time I'm treating a hyper-K patient. Um, it's important to give that, but you have to just be careful. So pre-hospitally, Presuming they're not, um, you know, end stage renal patient who can't tolerate a lot of fluids and is already fluid overloaded, you could start an IV and give fluids. We give the calcium up front. Particularly, there's EKG changes. So we'll see in the hospital. We'll know their potassium's high. EKG looks normal. I tend to not give the calcium up front in that case if I don't see EKG changes. But pre-hospital, you won't know what their K is. You're going to have a suspicion because EKG is going to be jacked up and you're gonna to wanna to treat them. Um, we got bicarb, um, the albuterol, and then if you've got regular insulin available from the patient, doing that with sugar. I'd say operationally, whatever's fastest, give first. To me, in the hospital, sometimes these meds have to come from the pharmacy, and it's super easy to get albuterol going, so I'll just start the NEB. You know, it'll all get ordered at the same time, but I'll be like, do the NEB first. That pushes stuff in really fast. I feel better that I'm out of trouble for a little bit, and then all the meds kind of trickle in from pharmacy. So functionally, like whatever works, um, it works for you guys. I think what everyone should get, if you think they have hyper-K, they should get everything that's on the list. All right, let's take a little break. We're gonna get into a few other kind of disparate complications, and they're sort of short, slides. I want you guys to be able to pay a little attention to them. So we'll take like a 10 minute break and come back. A few more uh, kind of complications and kind of other uh, endocrine uh, miscellaneous stuff to talk about that's important. 
Um, we're most of the way through the, the session so far, so that's why I want to take a break where we did because these are all kind of one and two slide topics that um, have a lot of information that's useful to you. So uh, diabetic nephropathy we'll hear about. This is one of the ways that all my patients in their like 20s and 30s who are, needed dialysis, this is why they, why they needed it. Because um, diabetes messes up anything with small vessels, with small tubes, and so it really causes a lot of scarring in the kidneys and causes uh, chronic renal failure. So often we'll see that in both the patients. Uh, we'll see both of those in these same patients. So it was called microangiopathy, was just affecting small vessels, um, the angio's vessel. And so they get lots of damage, they can't filter stuff out. So renal failure by definition, impairment of kidney function. We don't think we think, this is a whole separate talk, we don't think about the importance of kidneys all that often um, whatsoever, but they are involved in so much stuff in the body. So. You know, how we function with our water balance, with our sodium balance, with our potassium, which we just talked about, can affect your pH in your body. If your kidneys aren't working, you're gonna, re you're gonna retain things such as glucose, and you'll retain things such as um, urea that really mess you up. Probably don't remember this from, you know, except for way back in paramedic school, but your kidneys play a huge role in your blood pressure. And so if your kidneys aren't seeing the blood flow um, that they're used to seeing because diabetes kind of messed up all those blood vessels, it's gonna think that your blood pressure is low. And it's going to, over time, uh, cause changes in your body that are gonna bump up the blood pressure. And so diabetes leads to kidney problems, leads to high blood pressure. And so it's a very interesting uh, mechanism. So you often see these patients whose you know, blood pressure is high as well and then that affects the heart. It's just a really bad cycle. Uh, patients get chronic anemia because the kidneys also, again, kind of interesting stuff, uh, have a huge role in blood cell, um, blood cell creation and development. And so patients can be chronically anemic as well. And so rarely think of diabetics as just having diabetes. I mean, diabetics end up having, uh, over time, kind of one of everything. That's kind of the running joke when we give like a very brief presentation to um, an admitting doctor. I'm like, yeah, they've kind of got one of everything because I don't want to list all their medical problems. And some patients it's kind of just, it's implied. Yep, they got heart disease, they had a stroke, they got diabetes, they got chronic kidney disease. That's, you know, a lot of patients end up like this if they, um, they go untreated, which is very unfortunate. So it's hard to pick up just chronic renal failure. Like you're not gonna get that as a presentation unless they're a known kind of dialysis patient. But just think about if there's something that's new about their presentation, like, oh, I, you know, I'm not able to pee, my pee's really concentrated, and like I'm having trouble getting out of bed and feeling really tired and headachy. Some of that may be totally chronic, but some of it might be new. And so, you know, the lesson from, from these slides is you gotta work out what's, what's new by history and exam and what's kind of chronic for that patient. And sometimes it's really hard to tell. A few other endocrine disorders, we just really cherry pick the stuff that you, know, you might see that's common and that's really dangerous. Um, Addison's disease, this is interesting because, I don't know if it's it Oregon or not, this is a number of years ago, there was a, a push from a, a kind of a group of parents basically who wanted to change the state statute to require training on Addison's disease for EMS. Um, which is a much bigger discussion about, you know, should you be legislating what you have to learn as, as uh, pre-hospital providers? But so it's something that's out there. It's actually pretty uncommon, but it's a thing that can really hurt patients if you don't think about it. So these are usually patients, so they, in general, they don't make intrinsic steroids. They have adrenal issues. They don't make cortisol or enough uh, whole body steroids. So they're taking it, um, you know, in the form of pills on a daily basis. And for whatever reason, if they get sick, they get locked up, they aren't taking their meds, you know, like the teenagers who get sick of being sick and they, so they stop taking their meds, these patients can get um, this urgent adrenal insufficiency and, and look terrible. So symptoms include dehydration, often severe vomiting, diarrhea. They can have a lot of pains everywhere. Um, 
Often they can prevent hypotension and shock, again, looking awful, uh, unconscious, hypoglycemic. And this comes out of history. So you get a you know, patient in their 20s who is hypotensive, looks terrible, not responding to you. You, know, you want to kind of like you know, get them moving. You might not get the history from the mom or the boyfriend or whatever that the patient has Addison's, takes chronic steroids, you know, just has been sick lately or whatever has happened, ran out of their insurance and didn't refill their meds because, you know, that's the, f the fix for this. You know, you're going to be giving them fluids and other stuff, and the fix for it is to give them steroids. So sometimes you have a medic alert bracelet or someone that will clue you in. And hearing this, try to lodge it in the back of your brain somewhere because someone might say, like, we hear get a lot of history, like, oh, yeah, they take steroids. They're taking prednisone every day, and you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. It might not, this might not click, especially in a sick patient, that that's actually really significant, and that's probably, you know, contributing to them being so ill. Um, so these patients can get fluids, and then, you know, solumedrol is, you know, you see patients turn around pretty quickly when you're giving them their steroids back. Cushing syndrome is kind of the opposite. So this is excessive um, steroids in the body. This can be uh, just something that they have, or it's something that, like a disease process, or people that take chronic steroids can have a lot of this. So some patients take, you know, I've met some poor like Crohn's patients who don't have a GI doc. They've been on prednisone for years, which is, you know, super old school, like 80s Crohn's management, and they have all of these problems. Or patients have the true Cushing syndrome where they're just making too much cortisol. So these are the ones who are like really obese. They've got the, the kind of big round face. They've got the little like fat humps on top of their clavicles, which is like a dead ringer of too much, um, too much steroid. Um, they get diabetes from this, high blood pressure, excessive hair growth in kind of weird places. Um, osteoporosis, these patients can you know, break their hips really easily. I met a woman who um, had some kind of pelvic pain from, she was in the shower, she like lifted her leg to wash her, just wash it in the shower, and she ended up having like a, you know, double pubic rami fracture just because she lifted her leg. Like the pull of the muscles on that part of her pelvis fractured it because she was so osteoporotic. Can get kidney stones, you hear about menstrual irregularity and then um, emotional liability. You know, this gets to be done from things that the patient just have, like these pituitary adrenal problems or chronic steroids. So Graves' disease, switching to another part of the body. So we have Graves' disease, which is a thyroid problem, um, hyperthyroidism. So I think of hyperthyroid. So we you know hyper is sort of like up, like you think about a hyper kid. Um, all the functions in your body are kind of in overdrive in hyperthyroidism. So people be restless, anxious, they have trouble with, um, with heat, like in the summer, you know, early summertime, they're the ones who are always hot and can't tolerate it. You know, sweating, tachycardic, um, can get, in the really bad ones who've had it forever, you can just look at them, they've got like the huge goiter, their thyroid is in overdrive, so their thyroid is actually giant, you can see it on their neck, and then the eyes are like kind of big and protuberant. Um, those are like your dead giveaways from from the doorway. So there's something called thyroid storm, which is rare, but it's one of those real true emergencies that, you know, history will kind of get you there. Cause these are patients who, you know, they look septic and they're tachycardic and are just super febrile and look awful, but you have to kind of get some of the history that they, you know, have a thyroid condition. Sometimes they don't even know and we find it on, on blood work. You can, spark from anywhere someone gets a reaction to anesthesia or certain medications or they're actually taking a thyroid supplement and they overdo it patients who have graves disease can try to treat it for a while with uh, medications that keep the thyroid down but if they stop taking those they can go over the top or like anybody if they just get sick from other stuff that can push them into it terrifying stuff so these are febrile sweaty patients usually super uh, hypertensive, really tachycardic, can go into heart failure, lots of psych stuff like agitation, confusion, and have seizures and come in in a coma. And if you see the patient who's super tachycardic, looks terrible, and then they got that, those buggy eyes, and you see the 
you see the thyroid goiter, like that's your clue. But I wish it people read the textbook more often. But this is another one of those ones that you may or may not ever see, but in the super sick patient, you should at least think about it. You know, like I think rarely is endocrine on on our differential as it should be. It's just not as common of an emergency, but it's out there and it's a real thing that we could take care of. Patients can get rhabdo from their whole body kind of freaking out. There's not a whole lot of options pre-hospitally. So these are patients that need, you know, normal ABC stuff, fluids. Um, you can give some benzos for some of the hyperadrenergic effects. In the hospital, there's a series of stuff. So patients get beta blockers. They get different medicines to decrease thyroid hormone synthesis, decrease the release of the hormones. They get some sort of iodine. And then there's other uh, medications they get to prevent the effects of that thyroid hormone on the body. So there's a number of things in a fairly specific order that I always have to look up. This is one that's on every medical student's differential ever <laughs> that we rarely see, but it's, a, it's also kind of a real thing. Um, pheochromocytoma or pheo for um, sanity's sake. We're always thinking about pheos. So this is a tumor of the adrenal gland that just spits out um, epinephrine or adrenaline. So the patients are just putting it out whether they need it or not. And you can imagine all the effects that this has on the body. So patients can have really severe headaches, lots of sweating, typically very tachycardic, um, hypertensive, you know, anxious and nervous, right? It's to be expected, like they're constantly like having adrenaline pumping. I'm nervous, they get chest pain, nausea. Weight loss makes sense, they've had it long enough, right? Because you're just sort of constantly cranking. It's like being on a treadmill 24 hours a day. Heat intolerance for the same reason. So that's kind of an interesting one. That can be a little hard to diagnose. These patients usually need, there's like um, one you have to think about it. We get a lot of hypertensive tachycardic patients. We have to think about it. And then um, you know, these need like, they actually measure some of this stuff in the urine when it takes like a day or two. You send them home with like a big bucket to catch their pee for two days. Hashimoto's is another one of those uh, named things that's good to know about. This is the opposite. This causes hypothyroid. Um, so hypo, um, I always remember it as like hypo is low. You know, everything is kind of low and slow in the body. So these ones can actually get a goiter as well, which kind of sucks um, to try to differentiate one from the other because like the thyroid hormones like still banging away at the thyroid and it's just not like doing anything. But you get everything slow, so they're fatigued, they're gaining weight, um, they don't do cold very well, everything's dry, they can't poop, they can't stay awake. That's it. <laughs> All right, I threw that at the end. So I know we went through a lot of stuff. Um, are there any questions to clarify any of those, the diabetic stuff, any of those kind of specific uh, named diseases? Residual questions for the good of the group. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Whitwer? <laughs> okay, uh, we have some uh, case reviews now. You get out of this. Okay, a few case reviews, just for grins and giggles here. Priority three on a sick person. Patient's a 19-year-old male who was found by a bystander lying on a trail stating he didn't feel well prior to losing consciousness. So he's awake after losing consciousness. Friend arrived on scene and said he hadn't seen the patient for the past hour. They were not jumping from the cliffs Swimming in the river all day, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. <clears throat> Friend denies any known traumatic events, short of leaping off a cliff. Uh, states patient has been smoking marijuana and dabbing. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Denies alcohol or other drug use. Not aware of any medical conditions, medications, or allergies. So you have um, a person with um, some altered level of consciousness without any known findings. So starts out with normal sinus, it changed to sinus brady, then to a widened QRS rhythm during transport. And maintained SpO2 and blood pressure. That finally went to sinus tachycardia post intubation, no further change in pulse, etc. So left pupil non reactive, right pupil non reactive, both three millimeters. Uh, GCS originally um, about a five. Blood pressure 176 over 86, pulse 75, then did Brady down. Blood glucose 230. So even though he wasn't eating much all day, it seems to have done pretty well. I don't think we're going to make a case for diabetic ketoacidosis here, though. Um, naloxone given, no particular change. Blood pressure 164 of 84. Pulse 46. Temperature's 97. Pulse ox 99. So CO2 value was 13. What was his respiratory rate? 10 assisted. Hmm. Uh, atropine 0 0.5 given, uh, CO2 now rechecked and it's 34, so I'd say that was a little erroneous. Atomic succinylcholine intubated successfully. I think a good choice for the atomidate. Why not uh, ketamine in this case? He's already hypertensive. Don't think we want to push that one yet. Um, tidal volume, okay, everything is, you know, he's put on a ventilator, uh, pulse ox 99, 100, given some medazolam to, uh, for more continued sedation, given rock, because it's going to be a long transport. Um, And uh, pulse is 100, respiration is 10, MAP is 139, so it's still quite elevated. Um, forget it. Do anyone know anyone in Abbottville, Louisiana? <laughs> Me either. <laughs> um, okay, what are we thinking? How's this presenting? Is, is this a drug overdose? No. Yeah, we got yeah. altered level of consciousness, hypertension, bradycardia, elevated blood pressure. Yeah. Patient has a large intracerebellar bleed, so posterior cere the cerebellum is the posterior portion of the brain and it's where your balance and all your other stuff is and is real close to your brain stem. Uh, he decompensated in the ED um, and had a, an emergency, uh, emergent ventriculostomy done. And the neurosurgeon went in, put a drain in to drain the bleed, to drop the pressure, but uh, he was not ex not expected to survive this. Probably traumatic, probably from a, maybe from a hyperflexion injury, a hyperextension injury, <laughs> <laughs> going over the, uh, go, you know, jumping off the rocks. We don't know if he, there's no apparent head injuries, uh, you know, there's no bruising or anything, so he, he may not, you know, 
but just hitting the water. We uh, what, last week. Video of him being pushed. I just need to know. That. Yeah, that's what we need to know. Uh, did we have a video of the other one being pushed? Oh, you haven't seen that. No, I I know that I know that she says she was pushed. The mother said, but so they had a video of it. Yeah, they're really good. Videos. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that'll that'll become a civil thing. <laughs> Maybe a criminal thing too. I don't know. So, everyone is aware of that one. Okay, it's been in the paper, so we should be. So, anyway, this was a good job. Good man. Good job of management, intubation, long-term paralysis, all appropriate. Uh, you know, sometimes the magic doesn't work, or or it does work, and you still can't do anything about it. So that was a um, good evaluation, and where you don't have much in the way of history, so you're just treating what you find. Okay, 56-year-old female who is reportedly complaining of difficulty breathing. On scene, patient walking out the front door of her house toward us. She is pale, diaphoretic, increased work of breathing. Patient says she recently had some kind of throat surgery and she's been short of breath for the last two days. She's been intubated multiple times for breathing problems, unable to give much more history due to respiratory distress. Respiratory rates, 36, pulse ox is 89 on room air. They put a CPAP on her, which seemed to help a little bit. Lung sounds were diminished. Um, albuterol was given by inhalation along with ipratropium, and I'm not 100% sure. I don't, I don't find any wheezes. I don't know if the lady is striderous because it wasn't recorded. Uh, she had throat surgery, so it's unlikely that she's got wheezing from throat surgery. I would bet on being stride, more striderous. Uh, so I would think that maybe you, if you're going to give anything, you might consider just straight albuterol or a, even a racemic epi, which seems to help a little if you're worried about edema. Or nothing, just the CPAP seemed to help out a great deal. 95% on O2, and then 92, she's got a sinus dysrhythmia. Her blood glucose was 76. It is not documented in the record, which made me have to look at the record um, and pull up, and when I pulled up her hospital chart, she is a type 1 diabetic, so. She is on insulin. She is so a pale, diaphoretic, tachycardic in a insulin-dependent diabetic. Glucose of 76 would be treatable under our protocol. We say under 80 with symptoms. But she got five grams of glucose. Now, why five grams of glucose? Not documented why we only gave five grams, not even documented for sure who gave it, whether it was Vancouver Fire or AMR. And then I don't have a repeat glucose. <laughs> so got to follow this. So she's a type 1 diabetic, so I'm fine with glucose, with giving her glucose with, with symptoms, with a glucose of 76, but then she only got five, she should have got 10, and she should have got a glucose after the fact. She has subglottic stenosis. Um, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'd have to, I'd have to say that her surgery for her throat subglottic stenosis did not work well, and uh, she did have Strider recorded in the ED. CPAP helped, and she ultimately has a tracheostomy. So we won't see her for that problem for a while. We'll see her for another problem. So takeaway on this one is document, if, the, if, if you're going to give someone glucose, document that they're an insulin-dependent diabetic for me. Document what the glucose is after you give glucose, if you're going to give 
underdosing. Use the right dose to start with and think about treating Strider differently than you're going to treat wheezes. Well, here's another one. Code 3 for a diabetic. This, is, this almost brings tears to my eyes just because, just reading the thing. Per bystander, the patient has no power in his house. He's been inside the, the whole house. Now, <laughs> that, it is hot house. <laughs> it's inside the whole house for eight hours, and the bystander, uh, why this, it, it's a bystander is the neighbor, uh, she checked his blood sugar and it was 400. Patient's inside, it's very hot. When asked his name, he doesn't, can't answer. Skin is hot, dry, pink. Lungs are clear, abdomen soft, obese. He was incontinent of urine, moves all with weak radial pulses. Now, impression. First impression is sepsis. Well, I don't know about that. Could we think of someone's in a hot house and they're, could this maybe be a heat related problem? Um, hyperglycemia, also problem with heat related problems. Uh, he's going to be dehydrated. We already know that he's hyperglycemic, so he's dehydrated. And other causes, well, I agree with that. Um, so, he was brought, taken for a sepsis alert. I'm not really sure why. Blood pressure is 176 over 126, that's a little high. Uh, pulse 150, respirations 20. Um, room air is, uh, uh, O2 on room air is 97%. Blood glucose, uh, re, uh, 424, EKG is sinus tac. So, nope, no temperature. So, that would be something I'd like to see. Uh, IV was started, uh, total infused 10 cc's, three attempts, must be on the way in, I think, so. Okay, the guy had a heat stroke. He also had rhabdomyolysis secondary to the heat stroke and being down. Uh, he was obviously dehydrated. He was hyperglycemic, he had acute renal failure and everything responded to rehydration. The 10 cc's we gave them didn't help much. So they carefully rehydrate. You don't, you don't rehydrate the heat strokes really fast. You don't want to do that because uh, they have a tendency to go to, at least they used to have a tendency to go to um, uh, congestive failure fairly easily. Heart seems to be a little stunned. So. But if you rehydrate them carefully over a few hours, and, and that's all they did on them. Also, this patient with these vital signs needs a 12 lead at the very least. I want to see a 12 lead on these guys because we don't know that this, is, that this wasn't somewhat cardiac related too. So, um, I don't think, uh, and we need the we need the we need a temperature. I think in a, if a hot person's in a hot house on a hot day, I think we probably should put put uh, heat-related injury up highest rather than sepsis. I don't mind calling a sepsis alert on it because that mobilizes people, but you, you won't end up being sep you, know, you end up treating it pretty much the same way. Okay, number four, motorcycle. Arrived to find patient supine approximately 40 to 50 feet down an embankment. <clears throat> now this is an interesting patient. She was 
63, 64 years old, give or take. Uh, she is riding with her husband in a, in a motorcycle with a sidecar. He's on the motorcycle. He, go, he plunges. They're plunging over the cliff. He jumps off the motorcycle. She has to jump out of the sidecar. So she doesn't make it quite as quick. Um, we don't jump quite as quick when we're 60-some years old. She then tumbled to the bottom of this 40 to 50-foot embankment. No loss of caution that she, re that she recalls. She says she remembers falling down the hill, stopping at the bottom of the hill. Motorcycle went down the hill, and she complains of pain in her ribs, stomach, back of head, and arms. Put in full spinal precautions, secured a long backboard, long backboard to a Stokes so they can haul her out of the ravine. She has two episodes of vomiting is rolled to the side while strapped to the Stokes basket. Now slower to respond, needs multiple prompts to answer questions. Moved up the hill, activated life flight, moved to stretcher, stretcher to ambulance, transported to life flight landing zone, patient given IV Zofran and fentanyl. Has intermittent periods of slow to answer, then able to answer questions, getting frustrated due not to be able to recall her medical history and her name. She transport, transferred to the life flight crew and she's shown, flown to Southwest. So this is a documentation, uh, facility activation modified trauma. Well, I'd consider with her changing level of consciousness, which I think she probably had a, probably had a, uh, a, a, a GCS that was a little lower than that, somewhere along the line. Uh, you get to call the lowest one. Uh, she, she probably should have gone as a full trauma. Um, she got ondansetron, Zofran, she got some fentanyl, doesn't say whether she got better after that or whether she vomited, in the, I don't think she, she vomited in the, to the crew. Uh, pulse ox is still good, uh, I think the lung sounds were okay. Um, kind of a ratty three lead to follow that, but I think it settled down a bit. So, she desat it in the, in the helicopter. They recorded two recordings of low 80s. Um, they did not needle her chest. She seemed to, well, they messed around with her a little bit, apparently just waking her up a little bit more, and she, her sats came back each time. She ended up with a small subdural, a small subarachnoid bleed that didn't change over six days, and, and so the neurosurgeon did not, did not have to do any intervention on that. She also had a grade one liver lack and a grade one splenic lack, which means that she had no, she had, although she fractured her liver and fractured her spleen, she did not break the capsule so there was no intra-abdominal bleeding and it stops bleeding and we like to we kind of like to keep people's liver and spleens in them if we can which we did she had multi-rib fractures a huge pulmonary contusion and continued to desaturate at night when she was sleeping <laughs> So the nurses kept waking her up, I think. Um, she broke both wrists. She had to fix the right one surgically. She was in the hospital for six days. They were, by the way, traveling from um, Oklahoma. And uh, they felt she was stable. They were, they were kind of concerned that they were, you know, staying in the hospital is the one not as comfortable as a lot of motels and, and hotels and also a lot more expensive. So they wanted to go, they, they wanted to get out of there, so they let her go to a motel for two days in Vancouver so 
she would have rack, rapid access back to the hospital if she got worse and she was checked each day and she got better. Then they had the big decision whether they would fly her home or let her drive, or drive home and considering that, so the surgeons decided that even with the pulmonary contusion and some desatting that she was probably safer to fly home than she was driving home given their history. So she flew home and she's apparently done well since we haven't seen her since. Or haven't heard from her other than the fact they, they checked with her by phone and she was good. So that was a good case of packaging, good case of everything. I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure. I think probably relieving some of her pain allowed her to, to rest and probably fall asleep in the, in, the, in the helicopter, which is why she's desatted. Uh, it would make an, an interesting argument whether uh, a lot of time, a lot of ambulance or air ambulance will, will have, would, might have darted her chest to start with, with the, you know, their findings. Standing with our certain problem is. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, small sedan off the road into a brick wall at an apparent high rate of speed. Patient had already been backboarded and was loading him into the ambulance uh, and ready to load him in the ambulance. He was conscious but not alert, flailing, not following commands. He was the restrained driver. He was RSI due to his GCS, massive facial trauma and an inability to protect the airway. Massive amounts of bloody tissue in the airway prevented ET tube from passing. Now, Came into view multiple times. He was desatting, so an eye gel was placed. Patient bagged with difficulty until the right chest was darted. Then CO2, SpO2, and bagging compliance all improved. Patient transported the ED, turned over to the trauma team with no further changes. His vitals were um, pulse ox initially 88. On O2, CO2 was 21. This is after the, um, no, uh, this is before uh, GCS um, says 15. Um, I'm not sure about that if he was flailing about and not responding to, not, not following uh, directions. Blood pressure 132, pulse 110, lung sounds absent in the right ronchi in the left to the eye gel now question is was the eye gel the best choice um, was a crike the choice possibly with massive facial stuff um, then he got the, a needle thoracostomy and things improved. His blood pressure actually got a little better. Pulse went down. His uh, CO2 is 33. His O2 sat is up a bit to 91. So that's perhaps improving. Um, the eye gel, of course, is, um, seemed to be doing okay. The eye gel was immediately uh, replaced by the, in, in the ED. It was thought after the fact in the ED that he probably had had an MI or other cardiac or brain event prior to crashing. There was no indication that he slowed down whatsoever and went right into the, off the road. Um, and he had a massive intracranial bleed, whether it was from, he had enough facial trauma to think it could have been from that. Uh, he had a large pulmonary contusion, a pneumothorax, uh, probable small pericardial bleed, not enough to cause a tamponade, 
had moderate intra-abdominal bleeding. He went on massive transfusion protocol. Uh, Dr. Carmi Jones was the trauma surgeon that day, and he you know, jumped on him really quickly. And unfortunately, he kept going in and out of uh, cardiac arrest, and after five cardiac arrests in the, during the resuscitation attempt, they realized this was probably futile. And they're not, you know, weren't going to go any place with that. Um, I don't know if they ever got a confirmatory 12 lead to, that was accurate enough to show that he had a myocardial infarction or not. But um, a, a difficult um, intubation at the scene, so um, I guess the eye gel is quicker, and considering he was paralyzed already, it uh, uh, moves right along, and um, you'd have to, you'd have to, uh, they did not, they did not do a cryic in the ED, because with the glide scope, they were able to intubate him. So, um, interesting bits of trauma. Okay. Well, we have exhausted our time. Uh, next month, Mark, what is next month? You'll wing it. <laughs> next month, it's another lecture series. Another lecture series. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, be careful out there. Don't do, don't, you know, don't do any diving off the rocks. <laughs>